As a result, faith in the UN began to diminish. A 1959 Gallup poll reported that 87% of the American people thought the UN was doing a good job. But by 1980, Gallup reported that only 31% felt the UN was doing a good job. Resistance to the globalist agenda was also felt on Capitol Hill. Between 1975 and 1982, Congress received petitions with over 11 million signatures calling for the United States to withdraw from the United Nations. But the battle had just begun. The top planners behind the globalist drive did not underestimate the resistance they would face. They were committed to build their new world order in whatever way they could, in whatever time it might take. That was the subject of The Hard Road to World Order, a frank article published by the Council on Foreign Relations. In the April 1974 issue of the CFR's journal, veteran State Department official Richard Gardner expressed his disappointment that like-minded internationalists had failed to achieve what he termed instant world government. More importantly, he described an alternate route to the creation of an all-powerful superstate. The House of World Order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Following this approach, the House of World Order architects have adopted a variety of strategies, large and small, to achieve their goal. Yet the strength of each of their strategies rests on one key element, deception. For as British statesman Edmund Burke once said, the people never give up their liberties but under some delusion. In order to pave the way for national governments to surrender any political power to the UN, globalists need more than just a plausible pretext such as solving a crisis. They must also create the appearance of popular support for their plans. For several decades, the UN CFR Axis has been organizing non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, into a force that it calls Global Civil Society. This NGO movement has been developed by the CFR strategists as a deniable asset. For the NGOs must appear to be spontaneous and independent of the power structure. The desired illusion is that the public is demanding change. To drive their agenda forward, the CFR leadership uses the NGO movement as one arm of a giant pincer strategy. The huge NGO network applies pressure on government from below. The other arm of the pincer, consisting of CFR elites inducing political leaders, supplies pressure from above. While NGOs clamor for world governance, political leaders can respond, according to plan, to the so-called public will. And the transfer of more power to the UN is achieved when the pincer strategy is employed with a variety of pretexts. The plan to disarm civilians has been part of the earliest plans to disarm nation states. The motive is simple. If no nation is allowed the military power to challenge UN authority, then no private citizen or group should be able to resist that authority either. In the 1990s, the UN itself began to take a much more visible lead in this movement. In the UN presentation, Armed to the Teeth, the campaign for civilian disarmament is packaged as a response to a new threat. Suddenly, a global plague of small arms threatens world peace. The small arms crisis is so acute that the United Nations now considers it one of the gravest challenges facing the world. The UN demonizes the widespread availability of guns as the cause of tragedy and death and makes an extreme claim. It's not lawbreakers and terrorist movements that are the problem. It's the gun itself. The small arms are like uninvited guests who won't leave. 
Once they take over a country, they are virtually impossible to get rid of. For small arms are not fussy about the company they keep. They can murder indiscriminately. Men and women, young and old, rich and poor. This UN propaganda aims to persuade viewers that they will be better off, safer, if they allow government to take away their means to defend themselves. Of course, not mentioned in the video is the role of the UN and its revolutionary friends in fomenting much of the aggression described. The UN even goes so far as to cite the Rwandan genocide carried out with machetes as a reason to confiscate civilian guns. 800,000 men, women and children were murdered. A United Nations special rapporteur saw the disaster approaching. He warned the international community that if the arms were not collected immediately, the result would be catastrophic. In many of these instances, this horrendous slaughter could have been prevented if the civilian population had not been disarmed. Generating pressure from below, the NGO network also plays a critical role in the push for civilian disarmament. The Arm to the Teeth video contains a classic example of the pincer strategy at work. IANSA is a network of over 200 grassroots organizations from around the world, which coordinates the fight against the proliferation of small arms and also puts pressure on governments to act. IANSA was not created as the result of a spontaneous outpouring from global civil society as the United Nations would insist. It is entirely a creation of the United Nations in collaboration with tax-exempt foundations and certain socialist governments in Europe. Revolutionary strategists have long recognized that a crisis can facilitate a major change in political arrangements. Among the useful crises, war, or the threat of war, has always topped their list. The threat of environmental catastrophe is still another crisis being used to persuade Americans to accept a revolution in world political arrangements. Although many Americans have serious concerns about the environment, such genuine concern does not motivate the UN CFR elites. Their object is power. They have no interest in actually solving environmental problems as that would defeat their objective by removing the impetus for political change. More and more, Americans are being told that global problems require global solutions. Global solutions meaning UN power. History shows that giving more power to government is exactly the opposite of what those concerned about the environment should champion. The most spectacular examples of environmental destruction are those that took place under state control in the former Soviet Union and in its colonies. And it seems to me that people who are genuinely concerned about environmental protection should understand that the last thing we would want to do if we want to protect the environment is to turn over total power to a political elite that can despoil the environment without sanction. By contrast, the best protectors of the environment are private property owners, simply because they have a vested interest. Thousands of years ago, Aristotle pointed out that that which is owned by everyone is equally neglected by all alike. And of course, that principle applies to the question of environmental protection. Obviously, the people who have the greatest interest in preserving the environment are property owners, people who want to develop property to increase its value and transmit it to their own children. Convened under the pretext of saving planet Earth from environmental destruction, the 1992 UN Earth Summit was a major watershed event for the globalist agenda. The summit put governments on notice that major changes were needed in economic agendas and in our institutions of governance. The Earth Summit gathering was designed to give the illusion of planetary democracy at work. Delegates labored over details of language, while the NGOs lobbied outside for tougher measures. In fact, the principal programs to come out of Rio had already been worked out well in advance by the CFR brain trusts. In supporting the illusion of democracy at work, however, UN propaganda portrays the NGOs at Rio as an independent voice representing a cross-section of civil society. The Viking ship Gaia sails here from Scandinavia. 
bringing 10,000 messages from children of many nations. Here in the Global Forum, non-governmental organizations and environmental action groups hold their 